Good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to this first panel of uh, our third annual Chernin Security Forum, uh, which we are conducting online this year. Uh, following the keynote uh, speech uh, we, we had uh, before, uh, we are very pleased uh, to continue with this panel on success and failure in detecting invisible threats. And I should say, given uh, the annotation for the panel, uh, it's also important to mention that it's not going to be or should not be only about the ability to detect the invisible threats, but also about the conditions of governments to act on those threats uh, effectively. And it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, a great panel. Uh, we have a great panel of speakers here with us uh, today uh, to uh, share their views on this very important subject. Uh, it is, first of all, Dinatin Hidasheli, Chairperson of Civic Idea uh, in the Republic of Georgia. It's Gunhild hogensen uh, uh Professor at the UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. Third is Sarah Bresson, researcher at Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin. And uh, last but not least, we have Žiga Turk, professor at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. The way we're going to do uh, this uh, is uh, I, I will now uh, pass the floor to, to our panelists to deliver their introductory uh, remarks. Uh, we will proceed in the order given in the program. And uh, I would very much like to invite all of you who are watching us to uh, contribute your questions and comments uh, on a running basis uh, in the chat. And I will be very happy to pass them on uh, to our panelists to kind of uh, animate the discussion. So please do not hesitate to ask questions, to comment, uh, to join in the conversation. And I hope we will make it a really interactive uh, experience even in, in these admittedly difficult uh, conditions. So without further ado, let me now pass uh, the floor to Tina Tin to uh, give her uh, first remarks on the subject. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me uh, on, on the forum. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are under the circumstances and talking to the uh, computer screens, but, uh, but also there is an advantage to this type of events because we somehow uh, get engaged from different parts of the world in real time. So it's not sitting in the same room talking from different experiences, but we are actually living those experiences right now as we speak uh, during this panel. And I think that's uh, exactly one of the uh, one of the issues that um, the world is facing today when we talk about the threats and uh, the security challenges of the modern societies. Uh, the, um, apart from the traditionally well-known and discussed uh, issues, for example, we were talking last year on the same forum, uh, being it um, Russia's influence operations or being it Chinese economic, growing Chinese economic power or uh, being it terrorism and so on and so forth. Uh, today, uh, we have a little bit different challenge as I see it from a small window of the world from the Republic of Georgia. And that will be the fading uh, confidence in, uh, in um, progress, fading confidence in um, the possibility of addressing the challenges, uh, fading uh, belief that the current world, being its medical parts of its scientists or the leadership of the world is able to respond quickly and adequately uh, to a threat that we are all exposed to these days. So we have on top of all the, all the problems that the world was facing and were not addressed and were not properly dealt with now uh, facing even uh, bigger challenge that uh, prevents us from uh, life as normal as we knew it before the pandemic. 
Uh, and uh, um, here is another issue that, uh, that I'm most concerned these days. It's the uh, missing leadership of the world, type of leadership that will bring the hope uh, to the people of the world, that will bring the uh, courage to everybody to uh, not not to not to um, uh, not to be um, uh, over pessimistic and not to uh, give up, but to continue this fight and to continue the uh, good work that the people were doing uh, during all, all those years. Economic decline, uh, loss of the jobs, at least in my part of the world, is a huge issue. And when we are fighting uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, together with all the other challenges, unfortunately, another problem that we are facing today is that the uh, um, world is so overwhelmed with these issues that uh, some of the important, uh, very urgent um, you know, problems are kind of forgotten. Um, well, as I've already said, I'm sitting in Tbilisi right now in Georgia, and right across the border from my country, there is a very cruel war going on. Uh, in between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, what we are seeing these days, different from 2008 uh, Russia-Georgia war or different from the war in Ukraine, um, is that um, there is almost no reaction. There is almost no attention. There is almost no, uh, no uh, concern uh, to a scale that we've seen before, to a scale that we all know that we faced uh, again during the two other uh, warfares that uh, that were that happened just uh, during these last ten years, and it is scary because uh, on top of all the problems that uh, we are seeing today, starting from the humanitarian issues that are in in both countries, uh, ending with the uh, actually people, uh, lots of people dying, lots of people staying uh, homeless, and uh, uh, no vision of how things are going to continue. Um, we also see another trend that because of the missing leadership from the Western world, Russia is becoming as active as never, taking a lead, and once again trying to prove to, the, to everybody that they are the peacemakers. They are the ones who can, uh, in a part of the world where they were the main power uh, deteriorating the situation, they were the main power causing all the troubles and all the war affairs, now they are uh, standing in the middle, you know, calling the parties around the table and trying to show their uh, peacemaker's face. And it is scary. This kind of world is really scary and it's very much different from, uh, you know, uh, with all the inefficiency, with all the complaints we had over the years, uh, it is much worse uh, today than it was six, eight or ten years ago uh, when the war uh, once again broke up in this region. So. I would say, uh, uh, just to finish my intervention, uh, because I, I, I'm really uh, looking forward for the Q&A parts of it, uh, is that um, you know, my biggest fear is that um, the uh, biggest dream of the, uh, as we call it here in Georgia, of the evils of the world, who want to destroy the liberal democracy, uh, democracies all across and uh, set the alternative civilization, set the alternative agenda or the third Rome, as Mr. Putin was saying before in one of his famous speeches, um, is seen by them as an opportunity right now. Uh, and as it is seen from the Kremlin eyes, this is what's happening right now with the ineffectivity of the world, with this huge disinformation flows, talking about the West being unable to uh, not only to address the pandemics, but also to show solidarity uh, to each other, they are the ones who are trying to be effective and who are trying to prove the, uh, the case all across, not just in Russia, not just taking care of the pandemic, but right here, look, they are the ones who are solving the, uh, the issues with the, uh, uh, with the war that just uh, broke out. So um, I would say just to sum up that, um, uh, that uh, the absence of the kind of leadership that was there for, for many years, actually, it's not just because of due to the pandemic and now only uh, during the pandemic, but uh, it was there for a long time, is more visible and most painful at this very moment when uh, 
uh, all of us, regardless of which part of the world we live, regardless who is rich or poor, and what are the social conditions or political uh, conditions, um, uh, when we are all, all facing the same trouble, uh, that's when uh, when we saw uh, most tragically that uh, that this absence of kind of leadership that we were dreaming about uh, for a decade now um, uh, kind of um, um, struck all of us and uh, and uh, now we live with those circumstances and uh, to be honest uh, looking at the U.S. presidential elections, the never-ending Brexit and all the problems of the European Union. Uh, some, sometimes I think that I'm part, becoming part of that world that is uh, losing the hope and that is losing the uh, courage to, to go back and uh, fight once again for the, uh, for the values that, that we stood uh, for our whole life. So uh, my, my biggest fear, my biggest, uh, the biggest challenge I see today is, is that fading confidence and loss of the leadership that uh, uh, we are suffering from uh, all across the world. Thank you, thank you, Tinatin, very much. Uh, uh, before we, we we move on, let me just pick uh, pick right there. I mean, you 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 made sort of the the issue of uh, uh, of trust in in government, in in, in uh, expertise, and the missing leadership, sort of the cornerstone of your uh, of your intervention. And uh, spoke mainly about the, the the Western world or missing leadership from the West, the way the way I understood. Uh, and uh, let, let me just follow this with with a question. Uh, how did we get there? Why why is there this problem of missing missing leadership? And uh, do you have any practical steps in mind? I know how to uh, how to restore this uh, this, this trust uh, uh, and leadership. And perhaps there there is a corollary question to that. I mean, you you, you spoke about uh, the tragic situation uh, in in Nagorno Karabakh and how the, the the lack of Western leadership make makes it possible. Uh, first of all, for not for the conflict not to be resolved and then for, for Russia to uh, to play a more significant role. I mean, we are obviously very far from where we were 20 years ago when the US president hosted the talks in in Key West. Then, of course, there was Russian president hosting the talks in Kazan you know, some, some 10, 10 years ago or so. But my, my question is, is rather, given the COVID-19 pandemic, when, when, when we look at, uh, at Russia and about how the central administration deals with the situation, isn't the problem of missing leadership or something that we can see here as well, uh, actually, or is it, in your view, really something that that, that is uh, specific for for the Western world? Uh, well, uh, how we got there, I would uh, answer this question with one sentence. It's because we took too many things for granted. We, uh, most of us, okay, let's put it this way. Maybe not everybody, but most of us believe that. Uh, uh, all of that was done deal. Uh, democracy was a done deal. Uh, liberal democracy was a done deal. Accountable leadership was a done deal. We all believed that uh, scientists would have done, uh, were doing their job perfectly well and uh, everything was just going smoothly and nicely and nothing would have changed that kind of uh, state of affairs. And, uh, and, and that's when it got wrong. This is when we stopped fighting. This is when we stopped telling to the generation, I cannot speak for the whole world, obviously, but I can tell you on the experience of my own country and my parts of the world, not just but not just Georgia, but the whole Eastern and Central Europe, former Warsaw Bloc countries, as I see it, the biggest mistake we made was when we stopped talking about the uh, Soviet legacy, when we stopped talking about the uh, uh, terror of the Communist Party, when we did not abolish Communist parties like it was done in uh, in Germany with the uh, Nazi parties, the, because there is whole generation that grew in our countries who has no idea what was wrong with that system and uh, are very are not really resilient to the kind of propaganda and disinformation flows that is coming from TV screens or social media or whatever information resources they are using. I think this is when we've got it all wrong that we forgot that just the fact that we, my generation or generation older than me, we lived through it, did not mean that everybody else knew, uh, knew um, just by fact what was wrong with that. And this homo sovieticus, uh, 
uh, as Stalin was trying to generate from the uh, from the people living in on the territory of the Soviet Union is here. It's it's in the minds of so many people and so many generations, including the ones who are now teenagers or just uh, entered the universities. Because when you look at the poll results from country to another, you see the answers from the guys who are like 21, 25 years old who never lived a day under the communist regime, but are kind of nostalgic about the Soviet times, who who are telling things that you would you would have assumed were completely for, forgotten and, and lost, but, but it is somehow coming back. Then this whole gloss of the uh, right-wing uh, populist uh, movements all across the board, I think, is exactly the result of that. It's kind of a backlash that we are facing now with us getting relaxed and then getting more active uh, once we assumed that, uh, that democ liberal democracy was a done deal. Uh, as for uh, as for um, uh, whether it's just specific to the uh, Western world or the rest of it, no, it's specific to all of it. But the problem is that uh, you know there is this saying that there is no sad place uh, left uh, unoccupied. Or I don't know how it's exactly said in English, but I I think you know what I mean. And uh, and uh, for a while, Mr. President Putin took that place quite comfortably and very uh, confidently. Uh, it's not that he's doing things right, and it does not mean that it's like gonna last forever. But what it means is that in for a while, in a world that we live in, he was the one setting the agenda, and everyone else was just going after him. Uh, we were reacting basically to the actions of Moscow rather than being proactive and having the strong policies deterring the uh, next step of Kremlin. And I can easily say that it's exactly the same right now with the China. Uh, we are making exactly the same mistakes regarding the China as we were doing in, uh, in the middle of 90s or beginning of 2000s uh, towards the Kremlin. So no, that it's not exclusive to the Western world, but uh, they did take a huge advantage. All the authoritarian regimes all over the world took a big advantage from it and, and, and they are in a kind of uh, driver's seat and the rest of us in a passenger seat, trying to redirect the movement, but not necessarily driving the car. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, there, there is, uh... A direct follow-up question for, from one of the viewers, uh, which I will take the liberty of ask, asking you, uh, and then I ask you for, for perhaps just a, just a short response uh, before we move on. And the question is, do you believe that Russia is powerful enough to sow massive discord, or is it using the existing crises in the societies to further its goals and, and interests? In other words, is it, is it more opportunistic uh, in exploiting our weaknesses and vulnerabilities, uh, or does it actually have the, the, the power to sort of significantly shift, uh, shift the sense and create conditions for these crises? I would say very, uh, I have a uh, kind of um, ready answer to that question because over the years we were getting this question and kind of I'm repeating myself all the time. Russia is strong as we, let the, as we believe it is strong, exactly to the degree we believe it is strong. And my answer to that question is very simple. Uh, and it comes from the huge challenge my own country is facing. Uh, well, you know, we knocked the doors of NATO in Prague uh, during the NATO Prague summit, and uh, since then uh, we've been doing our best to get in. And and since 2008, it's been 10 years that we were promised membership. It's not there. Why I'm saying this story is because every time there is a question, okay, tell us guys, what is it that we need to do? What else we need to do? What else is missing in order to get in? Well, in open door discussions, obviously there are like long uh, um, uh, answers uh, making mainly nonsense to be uh, polite, but in closed door discussions, we were always told that, well, you know, there is an elephant in the room that is kind of uh, gonna get angry. And uh, as long as we are not ready to respond to its reactions, it's not gonna happen to you. And this is exactly where the problem is. This is exactly how strong Russia is. 
And every time when I was Minister of Defense, my question to all my colleagues was very simple. I was asking everybody during the NATO summits or ministerials, do you really believe that Russia is gonna engage in a war with NATO just because one day you will decide to get Georgia on board? And yes, everybody will say, oh, probably no. Then what's the problem? But the problem is that there is no leadership, there is no guy who will actually take the lead and will say that, okay, Moscow, hello, here it is. This country has done X, Y, Z, deserves it. It's us, you are not even a member, you have no say, they are in. Now let's do what you wanna do. And everybody knows that Russia is not gonna fight NATO because of that, but still there is no readiness to make such a step because of some, unexplainable fear, that is exactly the strength of Kremlin and President Putin. Not the real strength and power he has, but this kind of uh, fear that is out there uh, about him uh, that strengthens his power. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Gunhild, now uh, for, for your remarks. Thanks, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me as well to, uh, to participate in this panel. And I really appreciate the remarks that have just been made and to pick up on um, uh, the comment from uh, Tinot in, about that we've taken things for granted. Uh, this is what, and the, the title of this panel is about um, uh, invisible threats, right? And uh, invisible threats, so I'll just say what, what, how I'm looking at invisible threats or understanding it, are, are those that are difficult to detect and trace and difficult to attribute to a specific enemy. And uh, when we talk about the things that we have taken for granted, particularly in uh, democratic societies, because as was pointed out, we're seeing violent eruptions taking place in not least in Nagorno-Karabakh at the moment that is uh, not, not getting the attention that, uh, that it deserves. But within de democratic societies, we're not seeing violent eruptions occurring in the, same, in the same way. But this does not mean that democratic societies are not vulnerable. And what they are vulnerable to are in particular uh, invisible threats. So, these things are, are not threats where you see a tank rolling over a, a border and it's you know palpable uh, what that threat looks like, but instead it's going after uh, actually us. And, and this I think is an important point to make is that um, we're talking about leadership and the important role of leadership, but there's a very important relationship between leadership and the people of the societies in, in question. And invisible threats today, particularly those that are what I'm thinking of are misinformation and disinformation, like fake news and deep fakes, are, are going after the trust of people in society to weaken trust between society and the leadership, such that the leadership the, the power of leadership to even represent society becomes weakened uh, because there's less, um, less trust and uh, yeah, um, people just aren't, aren't believing their, their particular leadership. And there are also a, a heightened polarization of, of views. And, and it is, uh, I think, very important to keep in mind, and, and this is where the whole taking for granted thing is, that if we are not aware of the ways in which our societies are vulnerable, the, the, our vulnerabilities will be targeted and will become exacerbated if we're not really clear on, on what these sorts of things are. And this is the role that actually civilians play in the generation and the propagation of conflict. Uh, because it's, it's quite demonstrable now that um, through the propagation of disinformation, that trust is whittling, this is creating or, or uh, it's not creating, it's actually making use of polarized views that already exist in our societies. That's another thing with democratic societies, we have many different types of viewpoints. So but if there, there's one thing to disagree, there's another thing to suddenly really be apart and not not 
see any way towards discussion. We see that happening in a lot of different societies at the moment. This form of polarization is being uh, uh, manipulated and used uh, so that disinformation goes in and it exacerbates these sorts of things. And we see this uh, particularly arising in the form of different types of populisms, not least in far right populism, which in and of itself um, creates or or reflects a distrust between the people the good people and the elite the leadership who should not be be trusted um, when we think about invisible threats and the ways that these are are being used we of course need to think about the role of social media and where we're also taking a hell of a lot for granted um, social media has played a remarkable role in the propagation of disinformation, because disinformation in and of itself is, is not new, and, and we know that. I mean, we know about psychological operations from before, and, and the use of or attempting to uh, influence populations is not new. If you recall, in Afghanistan and Iraq, I mean, there's more recent interventions, but here we had the whole sort of like hearts and minds type of uh, theory that, well, we need to bring the population on side to sort of like buy into the interventions that we're engaging in. Uh, so, so that is not new. But what is significant is the role social media plays, because social media allows information to spread at rates that we've never seen before. But not only that, it's not like just a drop of information because all of us are engaging in social media in different ways. And al algorithms are uh, tunneling and forming and, and, and sending information to us on the basis of what are identified as our preferences. So when we're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and we're Googling, these algorithms are, are finding out what our preferences are. So the information that we're getting is like almost uh, custom made for us. So we end up in those bubbles that we're hearing about and we don't really have a sense of the different types of discussions that, that are going on. And this really helps create that, that polarization. So we need to be acutely aware of how information is being propagated and the ways in which it's influ influencing populations because this in turn is influencing the capacities of leadership to take leadership roles and this we say for example uh, not least um, you know popular uh, example the us um, which has really sort of pulled itself out but it's 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 becoming far more insular and um, and due to its own vulnerabilities, it's been very easily targeted in, in this particular respect. So I'll just leave it at, at that, but um, that's my thing I'm throwing on the table. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you very much. And also thank, thank you for connecting it very neatly to uh, what, what, what was discussed uh, before. Uh, I, I think in, in your contribution, you highlighted a very important issue and that's who is targeted now by these uh, invisible threats and that this, uh, this is the publics, right? And uh, I, I would propose that these days we already have um, much better tools than we used to, to sort of making these threats uh, visible. We have these sort of markers that we can use, you know, the toolbox to make them visible. But what remains unresolved is uh, the, the question how to effectively tackle it, because that's something that has to do with societal intervention. It's not about, you know, fielding, uh, fielding armies. Uh, uh, and perhaps you know building 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 walls and even enclosing ourselves behind those walls if that's something that we we really want to do maybe that's something that is really impossible it's rather about some sort of hybrid hybrid defenses and measures to uh to to, to build trust and it comes with uh, a lot of sort of ethical dilemmas i mean war of course comes with ethical uh dilemmas warfare uh, ever has but this uh you know, is is an intervention that has the population as uh, as its subject. So I just wondered, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Not on a sort of uh, the detecting part of, of these invisible threats, but 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 rather, you know, the uh, the the ethical side of the problem of addressing them uh, effectively from the side of of, of the government. Um. <laughs> Well, I would say to begin with, it's not just about the government. So uh, what 
is required here, and oh, now I'm going to throw out a really popular term, you know, which is like the trendy thing, resilience. So we can definitely criticize what we mean by resilience, and quite often resilience is considered an, a type of offloading of responsibility from, say, authorities like government onto the civilian population that, ah, you, you're responsible for this, figure it out yourself. That's not necessarily what I mean, but what I mean is that in the building up of trust, there needs to be a level of resilience, both in the population as well as in the government. And this relies on that trust relationship be, between populations and, and their governments. Um, part of our resilience uh, can be built up through education. And this perhaps comes into this question that you're raising about the, the sort of like ethical approaches as well, how do we educate both our young people, uh, you know, young children, but also those who are uh, older and have not been educated on this, but need to really step up their game now. And, and how do we share this? And, and this is very much based on uh, that systems within our governance systems are as transparent as possible. That both increases trust, but it also uh, provides opportunities for greater dialogue between the, the local levels and, uh, and the government uh, levels. Um, but also it's uh, uh, the, the education systems, of course, really need to be strengthened with regards to understanding what the government is about, uh, understanding one's own relationship to that government, not taking it for granted, uh, which is an excellent point, uh, again. Um, um, our responsibilities together with our, our governments and ensuring that communication uh, lines are open because uh, that, that we have a, a chance to be able to say what our positions are from our local communities, but that, that we um, are interacting with our, our governments at the same time. So. Just, yeah, some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, let's now hear from some Sarah. So please, Sarah, uh, can you share your thoughts on, on the subject with us now? Thank you very much. And thanks so much for having me alongside uh, these very interesting uh, people. Um, and I agree very much with, with many of the things that were said, for example, uh, regarding the lack of leadership and determination and in, in what we actually want to create in, in a future um, independently from any risks or threats and also certainly the vulnerabilities in, in relation to, to uh, social media and those things. Um, so I was I was very happy to see that you're asking these questions for the conference and the panel. Like, what do we know? What can we know? And then how uh, do policymakers act on it, or maybe fail to act on it? Because this is uh, um, exactly what my my research focuses on. And so maybe um, I I thought I would share, you know, um, first uh, our view of okay, what what um, can we know based on forecasting and foresight uh, methods? What can't we know, and why? can we not know uh, about these, what you call invisible threats, uh, or even sometimes, you know, visible threats um, and why, and also how can we maybe get uh, policymakers to act on them in a, in a better way, more consequential way. And so first, I mean, the future cannot be predicted, right? Um, the state of forecasting, if we talk about security and conflict, is that things that can be forecasted, um, something like outbreak of conflict or conflict events, um, can be forecasted with a certain margin of error um, uh, because we, we have models that explain conflict in certain places, certain types of conflict very well. So you have tools that can tell you, oh, there's a very high probability of conflict events in northern Nigeria in the next three to five months. But this is because we know that there has been conflict for a long time and we know very well the indicators, um, the structural indicators that are related to that. Um, but then apart from that, there's obviously a whole, whole host of, of issues that we cannot predict for sure. But still what we see is that everyone has an image about the future, right? Um, so, I mean, if I meet someone on the, on the street who looks at me strangely, I'm gonna predict what this person will do. Um, it's, it's a very evolutionary thing. Um, um, but the, the key here is that the way our brain works in anticipating what will happen is 
works very well for basically surviving the day and reproducing, but not for basically politically steering a whole European Union ahead, right? So there's a range of um, cognitive and social biases that influence this thinking about, about the future. And so what we do in our research is try to find out what are the mechanisms that there are and how can we make the, uh, the thinking about the future more explicit, right? Especially we work with like, foreign ministries and, and, and diplomatic institutions where a lot of the analysis is based on, on just, you know, having an embassy in the country and having uh, uh, evidence, uh, just qualitative information and so on. And, and the information is there, but it's very unstructured. And the way people anticipate certain things is also very unstructured. And it's really hard to then know how does this information we already have relate to very new ways of using data to predict certain certain things, which is something that that policy actors do right so the European Union has conflict forecasting um, in their conflict prevention cycle in the European external action service and also um, the, the German government uh, does similar things. Um, and the question is really how to integrate this. And the range of, of, of um, blind spots that, that affect this thinking uh, are things like, you know, relying on what just happened very recently. So we do scenario exercises. And three years ago, it was very hard for people to imagine that there is a global pandemic. But then when we do a scenario exercise nowadays, the first invisible threat everybody mentions is a pandemic, right? Everybody wants to do scenarios about pandemics nowadays. So there's this very big recency bias, like availability bias, what just happened? Uh, what do we know about? Also a big optimism bias. It's just really hard to imagine things to go very wrong. Um, um, this way of just like extrapolating what happens and thinking it will continue the way the way it is, or th this illusion of okay, this is the end of history. Things are probably going to stay that way because we have a very hard time imagining like fundamental change. But at the same time, when something just happened, people are very quick to think, oh, I knew this would happen, right? So we have now uh, active conflict in the South Caucasus, and all the people would tell you, yeah, we knew this would happen. Well, everybody knew something may happen at some point, uh, but still nobody knew when and how, and when it happened, still nobody could, you know, really, really react or, or knew what to do about it. Um, and so what we tried to do was basically combine foresight methods and make them strategic. So gather people to think about plausible ways how the future could unfold because you cannot predict it, but you have to basically imagine a range of things that can plausibly happen which go way beyond what we usually think is, is probable. But then based on that, not stop there, but um, really think about how can we act based on this? What are our strategic, what are our goals, right? What do, you, don't, what do we want to do? And therefore, and which is what, what uh, Tinatin uh, raised, you need a positive vision. You need to have a goal, uh, goal as like European community, as certain countries in Europe, of what you want to achieve because the threats and the risks, they're gonna come anyways, and you can react to them when it's time and you need the tools to do that. But first of all, you need to have a vision of, of where you wanna go, right? And then basically make sure that you have the right instruments that are robust across a range of possibilities that lie ahead, um, well, which no matter what happens, you are still basically making sure you go into that direction um, um, of where. And, and I mean, people may say this is kind of trivial because again, you know, we, we did, for example, scenarios on a breakdown of the government in Russia uh, or in, also in Belarus or also uh, even war in the South Caucasus with Azerbaijan starting an offensive and basically into Nagorno-Karabakh. And everyone would say, well, we all know this may happen at some point, but still making an explicit future story about how this may unfold um, and then planning instruments of how to counter this risk, um, you have an easier time to really have something in your drawer when stuff happens. And, and, and it's an issue because we did these scenarios and then uh, had pl planning workshops and people from European foreign ministries told us about their approach to EU's Eastern neighborhood. They said, well, we don't know what we would do if the, if the Russian government breaks down. We don't have, we, every time we think about what we do in relation to Russia and the Eastern neighborhood, we think, oh, would this work with Putin? Would this work with the Russian president? And if it doesn't work, then we discard it. 
But what that means is when something unexpected happens, you don't know what to do. You don't even have an idea of where, what is your positive vision? Where, where do you want to go? And so there are all of these, these uh, different tools um, that can be used in this respect. And, and the EU, uh, you know, now has a foresight commissioner and, and is starting to use these tools in, 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 um, in greater ways. But, you know, it's still uh, not very, you know, structured. There is this new process to have a strategic compass in the European Union, to have a joint analysis and basically also joint threat perception. And we also all know it's very important to basically get all European countries to agree on what, what are the priorities, right? So, so what are, we cannot focus on everything. We cannot basically spend our time and our energy on everything. But again, the analysis for the strategic compass is going to be probably classified. It's not going to be public, and 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 the the I mean, we expect that probably it will end up being a long list of things where every EU country puts something on it. But it's not really a process where we talk about what is our vision and what is the greatest threat to this vision and how do we prioritize based on that. Um, and I think if we look at at some of the very specific risks that that the European neighborhood faces is we have this incredible fragmentation of actors. So we have more little groups of basically armed actors and so on and so forth. If you look at Syria, it's a very good example. And on top of this, you have a layer of contestation of the established rules, basically contestation of how to do things, global contestation of the power structure. And this leads to a lot of uncertainty and this perception that there are so many risks that we can't really understand. And again, this goes back to like psychological biases in those times where we have uncertainty also now in a global pandemic, the tendency is to turn towards strong characters, right? Strong leaders, which uh, look like they have simple answers. And this basically reinforces these tendencies, these illiberal tendencies that we have, that we have Donald Trump as a president, we have similar figures in other countries. And, and this like exacerbates um, societal fragmentation and polarization, which is, as we know, the greatest risk to peace. So like conflicts break out when there is exclusion based on uh, constructed groups, so group characteristics. Certain groups are excluded, and there, there are these infights. And um, so, you know, this is a very, very uh, real risk, but the tendency should not be to turn to seemingly simple answers, but to you know, embrace this complexity and analyze these things because we know Turkey is in a position to exploit its geographic location, right? To do certain things because it can hold Germany hostage about the, the refugee situation. So we know these things, but still there is no basically clear plan. Okay, so what do we do? What do we wanna do about Turkey? We also know these tendencies on, on the level of warfare, on the level of, uh, Turkey using drones now in the South Caucasus, which is a technological edge that makes it very difficult for uh, the other side to counter it. Um, these things are all not new, like the rise of, of clandestine actors and all of that. So you need a, a more systematic approach to the future, what may happen and why, but you also need an ambitious vision of where you want to go, uh, despite all of, the, all of those things that may happen. Um, and so, so I guess I'll leave it at that for now. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Well, my, my question is simple, how, how, how to get there? Because much of what you said aligns with uh, my personal and our thinking at the Institute. We, we also try to engage in strategic, uh, strategic foresight uh, to, to think in terms of, of, of these uh, cognitive, cognitive biases and prejudices, which we all sort of, um, sort of use. We have certain repertoires of, of, of prejudices, which we use when we predict the future and we are predicting future all, all, all the time. Um, it's important to be aware of those biases at least. Uh, and that, that's, that's perhaps a step forward. But my question is, I mean, you spoke about uh, the strategic compass, the joint threat assessment, uh, that, that, that that's going to be the first stage of it. Uh, uh, and you expressed a certain skepticism about, you know, how far this this may get get us, and that that comes to the core uh, of of my question. You know, when in in your work, uh, you you deal with decision makers, and it's important to have decision makers uh, on board. How how do you sort of uh, deal with uh, 
you know, the, the bureaucratic practice, the standard operating procedures in which for very understandable reasons, perhaps these decision makers tend to be solving sort of the immediate issues and there may be very little time uh, for them and capacity to engage with these kind of long, long term uh, types, uh, types of thinking that would obviously prepare them better for, 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 the, for the future. Uh, and make the policy making better, perhaps. But th there is this uh, sort of great in bureaucratic inertia uh, and uh, and the need to deal with uh, problems at hand, you know, with the routine practice. So how how do you sort of break this? You know, how how, how to get uh, um, your message through? Yeah, I mean, when I was thinking about this question of, um, you know, which threats do we prioritize, and then I thought about in a region like take South people living now in Nagorno-Karabakh, right? For them, it's not hard to prioritize the threats because it's re very real, like all those places which have a very close neighbor where it's obvious which, which, which is the main threat. And so in a way, and this goes um, back to, to what some of the others said, that maybe we are not obviously threatened enough, right? Because we are now threatened by all of these things like climate change and, you know, a pandemic that may happen at some point that are very hard to imagine. And so every time it's when you say Germany has a hard time prioritizing what the main security threat is, is A, obviously people just don't feel clearly threatened by one thing. And probably what threatens them most are things like what uh, Gunhild said, like the, you know, disinformation and all of that, which is very hard to see. Um, um, and I think this needs a lot of explanation and a lot of, you know, showing people what happens based on this. And I mean, we can't see it now. People are afraid when they see um, the polarization that is happening in the US, when they see people in Germany protesting against, uh, um, you know, rules uh, against the pandemic, you know, which is like, you know, are you crazy? It's the pandemic and people walk around with signs and say, you know, their freedoms are restricted. Um, but I think what you talk about when, when, when well, what you asked in, in relation to the, the policymakers is um, that I think you can set better incentives at the organizational level, right? So currently, um, if, when people work in, in a bureaucracy, there's also a lot of So we seem to be experiencing some technical difficulties. Uh, the, the most okay, uh, threatening aspect of it, right? And so you can set certain incentives um, 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 of having a culture of failure because, you know, acting under uncertainty is very difficult and setting those incentives of, you know, also just uh, not um, joining in your organization's group think and agreeing with everybody else because this is what we inherently tend to do but actually incentivizing that your people say okay we all think this but maybe this and this may happen and i'm now sounding very crazy for it but we need to think about it you know and um, so i think there are these small small things that an, at an organizational level that can be done thank you very much um we have some questions, a few questions from, from, from the viewers. Uh, I, I would like to ask uh, our viewers to not hesitate and ask, ask more. Uh, we are collecting those uh, before we, we get to the Q&A session uh, and, and ask those to, to our speakers. Let me pass the floor to Professor Jiga Turk uh, to deliver his, uh, his remarks. So over to you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be uh, in Prague, unfortunately, only virtually. Um, what I would like to talk about a little bit is about what can we do about expecting the truly unexpected. So my point that I'll be making here is that if we are really talking about the undetectable, invisible threat. What we mean is that they are impossible to detect. They're really undetectable. And my message here is actually that it's a fatal conceit uh, to borrow a title from Friedrich Hayek to pretend and assume that we can detect the undetectable or see the invisible. However, there's a bright side to it. And that is that in engineering, in biology, in our history like societies, we are used to that. 
we are used to dealing with the unexpected. Um, actually by training and by my, most of my day job, I'm an engineer. And as engineers, what we do is we, of course, we expect the expected. We try to expect as much as possible. Earthquakes typically are an unexpected event, but we expect them and we try to do something about them. And some, sometimes something happens in addition to an earthquake, like a tsunami that happened to the Fukushima nuclear power plant. And even though perhaps we did not exactly design for that particular problem, we have built in um, some features, some properties of what we have designed so that the unexpected can be handled. So what we do is, yes, we have bigger safety margins that, that uh, are needed. Um, we, and this was mentioned already in this panel in a, in a kind of sociological uh, perspective, we um, try to be robust. We try to be, um, we try not to optimize everything to the latest detail. Actually, the, 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 the bridge that collapsed in Genoa in Italy had this problem of over-optimization. And most importantly, uh, there is a design culture within engineers to somehow expect the unexpected. Now, there is a similar pattern, actually a much deeper pattern uh, in biology and in sociology. Um, the, the dinosaurs, you know, they optimized for this humid, nice, um, swampy um, uh, planet where there was an abundance of food and they grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, the mammals, they did not optimize, they did not expect that there will be a, a meter of it. But somehow they were, they happened to be better fitted for the cold uh, years and decades and centuries that, they, that, uh, that followed. So yes, the unexpected is the enemy in engineering, in biology and in society. But the fragility is its ally, it's its, its, its collaborator. So yeah, order is predictable. We like order, we can find order in many things. But chaos is not, and chaos is this unexpected thing. And the invisible threats that we should really talk about, or those invisible threats that are truly invisible, are the disorder, the stuff that we do not understand, the stuff that we not, cannot plot on some, on some trend line, linear or cubic or, or whichever. And as I said, there is a solution for the unexpected. And here I will put a quote of, um, my favorite hobby, uh, psychologists, uh, psychologist Jordan Peterson. And uh, he put it like this, something, something that we cannot see protects us from something we do not understand. And the thing we cannot see is culture and the thing we do not understand is chaos. So this is, this culture is the society's way, is the human way, it's the way of human societies, of human civilization to handle the truly invisible and the truly unexpected. Now, what is part of this, uh, what is part of this culture? Intuitions, habits, morals, social institutions that were not designed, but emerged and survived through the centuries and millennia and, uh, and even longer. How to make this a little bit more concrete, a little bit more specific. So take, for example, the threat of war. It's unexpected, you can prepare for it. You can, you can do all kinds of things, but in the end it will happen. And these intuitions, these feelings, these habits, this, that evolution uh, brought with us is something like patriotism. You cannot fight a war without patriotism. You can prepare technologically for everything, but without it, uh, you would be you would be a, a very uh, easy opponent. National cohesion, loyalty, respect for authority, and Winston Churchill, for example, was was very good at at playing into that during the the Second World War. Uh, take the threat of epidemic that everybody is uh, talking right now about. It was unexpected. I mean, let's not fool ourselves. There were people who were writing about, yes, there will be, there's a danger of epidemic. Nobody was actually taking them seriously. Otherwise we would not be where we are. But the way to respond to that, you know, you can, of course you do everything possible scientifically and medically and from the um, um, points of view of propaganda, et cetera. But in the end, 
the response is based on the sanctity, on the belief, on the intuition of the sanctity of every life. That's why we're fighting. That's why we don't do kind of cost-benefit analysis. Oh, the old people will die. Who cares? Let's, let's move on. Uh, the care for others and the empathy with others. And um, Yacinda Arden is a very good example of how to tap a leader that can tap into this. So uh, in the end, it's about, and this term, I think every, uh, every of my colleagues uh, mentioned this. Um, um, at the end, it's about, it's about resilience. It's about robustness. And not resilience and robustness of the individual, but resilience and robustness of a community. And this community should not be understand just like a community of Ljubljana or, or my faculty or whatever. It's not just the community of the living. It's also this community of the dead that brought us to this phase in, in, the, in the development of our culture and civilization and the community of the unborn. So what are we leaving for, the, for those that are coming after us? Uh, when we speak about community, this is not about an individual. It's also not about the whole humanity. It's wrong to care just for an individual. It's wrong to care for everybody. In the end, this community means something in between. And this community is about survival, survival, and it's about the resilience of a community, not of an individual, not of everybody. So to conclude um, about you know, detecting invisible threat, um, if they are truly undetectable, we can't detect the undetectable. If they are truly unexpectable, we can't expect the unexpectable but we have been able to manage such challenges uh, in the past as cultures, as civilizations. And my, my final message is that the intangible can handle the undetectable. Culture, civilization, those deepest intuitions, feelings, institutions that um, helped us survive to get where we are today. Thank you. That 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 sounds like a, a rather optimistic uh, message. But let let me let me ask. I mean, if the intangible, uh, the culture can protect us against uh, the invisible uh, and undetectable, as uh, as you suggest, how do we fix culture when 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 it's uh, when it's broken? How how do we build a robust community? As you say, I know it's not about the resilience of the individual. It uh, It, it's not about having the the all humankind uh, as a referent. It's about communities somewhere in between. How do we fix the culture that that is sort of the shield that we have against these threats? And how do we build the safety margins that you mentioned? You know, referring to engineering or borrowing from uh, from 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 engineering. How do we go about this? I'm afraid that part of the problem is that we got a little bit over reliant on the power of our, let's say, rational knowledge of science, of technology, um, that they will be able to solve everything. Um, we have started to ignore some of these elements that enabled our survival in the past where um, catastrophes, where the unexpected, where surprises were much more common than they are today. But yet, when you have something which is deeply problematic, which is very critical, like this epidemic, some, somehow you need to learn how to, um, how to, how to revive that. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of what um, I think Tinatin was saying about the kind of cultural heritage in the post-communist regimes. Now, those regimes went into great lengths to erase all these, let's say, cultural achievements uh, of the past. They tried to erase all institutions. Um, they tried to erase religion, which is a kind of keeper, institutional keeper of these, um, or institutional framework uh, that keeps these, um, these, these feelings and instincts and moral foundations alive. Um, and um, bringing that back would mean 
maybe a little bit listen to what our grandmothers would have told us. So I'm not giving you, you know, the kind of scientific answer uh, that um, many of the people in the in the security community would uh, would give you. Uh, and by the way, I my my latest research is a lot about the cybersecurity um, of the built infrastructure. So of, of all the stuff that is the built environment, et cetera. And of course you do everything scientifically possible and you model and you analyze and you, you create trend lines, et cetera, et cetera. But um, in, this, in this intervention, I wanted to, uh, to say that there are limits to what we can expect. And there are tools with which we can address the increasingly small part that still remains, that still is surprising. Thank you. I, I think that this aligns rather well also with what, what Sarah was saying about one of the limits of predictions that we should be yep. aware of our, our, our limitations, uh, but still that should not sort of incapacitate us uh, uh, when, when we try to face these threats, including those invisible ones. We have about 15 minutes left on this uh, panel and we have a few questions. Uh, from from our viewers, uh, I would like to invite them to uh, ask more or comment uh, on whatever has been has been said and join in the conversation. In the meantime, let me ask the first question that we have, uh, and it's a general question for the for the whole panel. Whoever would like to pick, pick up on this, please do. If miss or disleading information is used or spread on social media, should the governments ignore? social media when making uh, decisions. So please, would anyone like to pick up on that? Uh, so I have many, okay, okay. Uh, so I, I, I saw Sarah's had first, then, then Gunhild and then uh, Jiga, did you want to also uh, something? Or, yeah, okay, so please, if we may in, in this order, thank you. Thank you. I, just because I also noted something down when, when Gunhild talk, talked about social media already. Um, I mean, it's certainly true that this poses a lot of problems because just the, the speed at which information uh, spreads and, you know, the, the ability to connect with people who live, you know, somewhere completely different. We had propaganda before. We all know that. Don't need to talk about that. And we also had the problem of polarization before. But I mean, I think also the social media part, it has this positive aspect of it creates a range of opportunities that I would not want to miss, right? So I don't want to sit down and say social media is our problem, but societies need to have a say in this. And currently the problem we have is exactly that, what the, the question points to is that governments don't don't basically, uh, you know, see what's really good for their citizens and what what they would want out of this in a, you know, not in a in a bad way of like propaganda and misinformation, but in like protecting them and like um, protecting the resilience because this this um, what was also raised that a basis of resilience is social trust and like legitimacy of of the governing uh, actors um, means that you need to have a ruling ruling uh, class who who dares to speak up against social media companies and does something against it and in the details it's very difficult because you don't want censorship and and you know you don't want to just you know uh, basically undermining freedom of speech but this conversation needs to happen and there's such a massive power imbalance between like facebook leaders and uh, a european government um, and i i mean to a certain extent don't understand why why the european union doesn't do more on that front because they, they did some things with gdpr in terms of data protection um but um given how big of a threat this is um certainly around things like uh, elections i think um we have to have better rules and need to work with the designers and and Zika talked about designers right there are engineers working at these companies they they you know need to work with um politics together to basically design better solutions. Thank you, Gunhild, please go on. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I, I agree with what Sara says and, uh, and I, re <laughs> I realize that perhaps I, I put this big dark cloud over social media. Um, of course, it has a lot of benefits and I also don't want to be without social media. But what I also mentioned 
was that the, the education factor that uh, we actually have to be more savvy about social media and have a better understanding of how it works. So there's a lot of very good stuff that comes out on social media. This conference, for example, is being tweeted as we speak. So that's very positive because what we're talking about here is now reaching a far broader audience than it otherwise would have. And that's very beneficial. We have the capability of sharing our knowledge, our research and asking questions in ways we never could before. So that is uh, really, uh, really positive. But uh, and, and for this reason, governments should not ignore social media. Governments should be as well in tune to what's happening on social media for two reasons. Uh, one, because it is also a way of communicating with the public, of having some of those open channels with, with the population and, and having some more open discourse. So it has that possibility. But also our leadership needs to be uh, aware of what kind of narratives are out there and how they're functioning, to what degree they are influencing certain segments of the population. So our leadership needs to be far more savvy about how uh, social media is functioning. We're not gonna get rid of social media. We could just say, ah, you know what? This was a bad idea, uh, cut it off. There's no point in doing that. I'm not gonna take myself off of Facebook or Twitter or, or stuff like that, but it's having a better sense of how this is being used, how we can use it better and using it to enhance transparency and dialogue rather than putting us into these uh, different bubbles. A lot of that uh, power lies with us along with our, our governments and that we need to be aware of. Thank you, Giga, over to you. Yeah, um, I think two or three years ago, the European Commission set up a, a high level group on fake news and uh, disinformation, and I was a member there. And all I would like to add to this discussion is that um, there is one thing worse than uh, the spread of uh, disinformation and fake news. Uh, and that is that the governments would try to use the social media companies or to empower the social media companies to, um, well, censor basically um, the social media and the internet according to the liking uh, of, of the governments or of the mainstream politicians. Uh, there is a huge shift in the way in which information is disseminated. The old model was that there were some gatekeepers that were very much, let's say, aligned or connected uh, with mainstream politics. Uh, and they kind of controlled a little bit the narrative or quite a bit the narrative um, that existed, um, that was out there in the open. Uh, now this is gone. Uh, this is actually bad because you need to have some kind of an elite that has a bigger say in society than, um, than the rest. This may sound undemocratic, but um, our democracies are made in such a way that you get, well, more and more and more capable people closer to the top and in, in every subsystem, this should somehow be the case. Uh, but um, as I said, I think that the, the only thing more dangerous than this information would be the introduction of censorship uh, by the governments or by the social media companies um, under the pretext of stopping this information. Um, I think after these two um, kind of landslide surprises, which was the Brexit referendum and the election of Trump in 2016, um, actually very few uh, political events have been um, attributed to disinformation. I think people got much more resilient. People learned that they cannot trust uh, everything that they see online. And there is still a lot of disinformation, but it has mostly, I would say, entertainment value, not so much uh, what people would believe. Thank you very much. Tira Tim, please. Um, if I can, I completely agree with everything that was said, just to add one more point uh, to the list as, uh, um, as it was said of uh, what is worse than, uh, than something else that we've already seen, I would say is that uh, to be under the false impressions because of the, uh, uh, from the social media because of the predominant, uh, sometimes predominant uh, influence by the uh, artificial sources, being bots or trolls and so on and so forth. 
because well, information society today kind of replaced the traditional forms of democracy, right? If we were going before, I don't know, twice a year or four times a year, or a year uh, on a town halls, we have these town halls basically live all the time. You can go uh, log into your Facebook account and uh, get the impressions of the society on whatever decisions government is making. Uh, you can uh, kind of hold the pulse of the society from the social media. But at the same time, there is a fear that uh, if there is an um, artificial attack of, with a concrete uh, concrete idea and government is not able, is not does not have enough capacity to differentiate between the uh, real stories, le real impressions, real people uh, communicating with the government and the attacks by the trolls or bots, then, then we are in trouble. Then there might be completely false pretenses uh, guiding the government's decision making. So that's also pretty scary. Yes, I'm completely against censorship. I do see a huge problem with government using uh, lots of different variations of uh, uh, fighting disinformation for the censorship purposes, but at the same time, there is another side of the story that uh, you might get decision making based on something absolutely unrealistic and non-existing uh, social order uh, as it will be portrayed in the social media. Thanks. Uh, thanks for all your responses. Uh, we have uh, another question from a viewer, uh, which goes specifically to Sarah. What is the result of your scenario about war in Nagorno-Karabakh? Uh, if you can share with uh, us uh, at least pieces of uh, uh, your your thought and, and and the foresight that you've done on it. Yeah, I, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I can actually also share the link uh, to the scenarios. They're quite detailed. Um, I think what's what was interesting, I mean, our job was to cre create scenarios with uh, basically war and conflict, right? So I'm afraid there is not a positive end to the scenario, but this is by design because the, the task was to, to basically imagine how things could uh, go wrong that we don't necessarily expect. And back when we did the scenarios, which is like, I think two years ago, um, everybody talked about it as a frozen conflict. And you know, now hindsight, we think, oh, we knew it would blow up. But back then we were like, okay, how can you imagine this uh, actually to, to um, get active again, this fro so-called frozen conflict. And, and we had to, in the scenario, create um, like an, a scenario with the breakdown of the government in Russia, because people had such a hard time imagining that this status quo would in any way be challenged, you know? So we had to imagine like a, a, a complete uh, breakdown of the social contract in Russia and basically a power vacuum. Um, which would basically uh, um, open up uh, an opportunity to start war there. Um, and I think the current situation is very interesting because it tells us that how, how hard of a time we have to imagine change, right? We need to have crazy, crazy openings uh, to, to imagine such a, such a um, frozen conflict to get active again, but it's actually not, it was not that unlikely to begin with. But I'm going to share the share the, the link and uh, maybe one one uh, short comment on on resilience um, because it came up a couple of times and, and we also did some research um, and I think this is an, a very important point to see resilience as kind of like the positive entry points that one can find right because it's easy to talk about risk and threats all the time but the question is where to start if you want to build a, a basically a more stable baseline but also this stability um, is a bit misleading because, for example, in, in, in Lebanon right now, we had a discussion on the topic yesterday in our project, and in Lebanon there's uh, currently this popular movement against resilience. So they're campaigning and they're saying we don't want to be resilient anymore because we want a different system. Um, but this is kind of based on the fact that there is a misconception of what resilience means, because resilience does not mean stability. It means that you're able to adapt, or that at least that's what I think how it should be seen. Um, and so if they say we don't want resilience, it's because it's been used as an excuse to keep the status quo and make it more stable, uh, while it actually should mean that you know you, you need to adapt with the challenges, which would mean that, that the system needs to change. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we, we only have one minute uh, left, uh, but there, there is one question from, from a viewer uh, directed particularly uh, at Giga. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, an advocate for the age of reason among, among our viewers who, who ask, isn't there really any possibility how to detect the undetectable? So Giga, if you can just please shortly, uh, you know, perhaps expand on what, what you said uh, before in your presentation. Um, you know, Actually, um, I think we should admit that there are things um, that are undetectable and not pretend that we can detect everything. It's a little bit like rising from the dead. You know, if you hear that today somebody raised from the dead, it means he was not dead enough to begin with. Uh, and it's the same with the detecting the undetectable. There are things and we should not have this, this um, conceit we should not have this this uh, this audacity to think that we can um, uh, predict everything, and this will make us a little bit humbler um, and tap into some of the resources that the the centuries and the millennia um, left uh, in us to handle the the invisible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our great panelists for, for a very interesting discussion. Thanks to Tina Tin, Gunhild, Sarah, and uh, Jiga. Thank to all of you who have watched us and who are with us uh, this virtual Chernin uh, Security Forum today. Uh, we will be continuing in 15 minutes with a second panel uh, on divisions in Europe on uh, on threats, so perhaps uh, some some of the themes that we touched on, like the strategic compass and the joint threat assessment, uh, will be discussed uh, in in more more detail. So thank thank you all for uh, your contributions. Thank you for watching. Thank you for connecting. And bye bye.